All right, everybody. We are live once again. I'm so happy to be back online. Um, uh, welcome to the very first um, Studio Class Online Fall uh, 2020 um, talk. And I'm so glad to be kind of picking up where we left off with um, Dr. Connie Frigo. I'm sure she needs no introduction, but I'll go ahead and, and just give a, a few words. Uh, Connie has been, you. Uh, how long were you in the in the Navy band, Connie? Six years. She's in the Navy, Navy, U.S. Navy um, band out of D.C. for six years, uh, and has been a professor at University of Tennessee Knoxville, University of Maryland, as currently the professor at University of Georgia. Um, former baritone saxophonist and grant writer in the New Century Saxophone Quartet and is the, also the co-founder and was the inaugural chair of NASA's uh, Committee on the Status of Women, in, where she now serves as co-chair. Um, also with me, uh, again, is Ellie Parker, um, now uh, an ABD doctoral student at the University of Houston and uh, a, a good friend of mine. So, um, so happy for you to be joining us. And um, Connie, I, I thought, you know, would you would you like to give any more background um, of your own before we go and get into the questions? Um, no, that's a that's a good background in terms of the the timeline of my career. Um, it's been, you know, there was a period of time where I was a full time performer and did a little teaching on the side. There was a period of time where I was a full time graduate student for six years. And now I have been uh, most of the last 15 years a full-time uh, saxophone professor. Um, all of those opportunities and experiences have allowed me to investigate and um, gain experience in a host of other things, um, including um, starting new projects, uh, a lot of grant writing in the past, um, developing new projects, having a vision for something and seeing it through. Um, student <laughs> development, of course, we're all in the game of that with, uh, with our jobs as teachers, um, but that alone has also led me to some of the more interesting uh, questions that have come up along the way. Um, I'm big on questions. I, I live through questions <laughs> and um, the depth of the answer or the depth of the question um, can often help me know what my next steps are hmm. uh, in terms of my career or just any decisions I have to make. And so um, I can certainly say that along the way questions have deepened and, uh, and uh, widened my lens and a scope through which I see music and the world and my teaching. Yeah, uh, well, that's you know that's a that's a perfect lead in the kind of the first topic I wanted to cover with you on this, which was um, how did you find your, your yourself getting involved in advocacy? Like, was there a, speci a specific moment, um, or did your kind of career path just naturally lead you here? The the real pivot for me, um, where I can, you know, say that I began dedicating um, real time and research and uh, work to advocacy was when I became chair of the Committee on the Status of Women. And that was uh, three years ago, almost three years ago now. Three years ago is when the conversation started, which was started by Kim Leffert when she wrote to a few of us um, women in NASA uh, to propose the idea of this panel discussion at the 2018 NASA Biennial. Um, prior to that, there were hints of it along the way. I would get asked all the time, uh, especially when I was a member of the New Century Saxophone Quartet, all the time from the audience, what is it like to be the only woman in the group? <laughs> what is it like to play that big instrument? I mean, sort of the cliche question that a lot of people like to ask when they see a woman playing the baritone saxophone. Um, I, I wouldn't say I was an advocate at that point um, um, because uh, becoming an advocate has taken a lot of deliberate steps and a lot of deliberate actions on my part. Um, so 
having the privilege of working with the CSW and learning through all of the difficult conversations we've had and um, collaborating with just so many cross sections of NASA membership and, and outside of NASA membership too because it's 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 grown relationships outside um, has really uh, informed me about what it means to be an advocate which which then um, once you become an advocate in one area it's actually uh, it can be difficult to not view other things that you care about through the lens of being an advocate so it has broadened for me since then, for sure, um, and that's that's kind of where I am on my on my own path right now with it. Um, but the CSW, uh, I, I I became an advocate through CSW. So, I mean, so if you don't mind sharing, what what are some of those other areas of interest that that you really <clears throat> feel passionate about that you that find yourself being an advocate for? Yeah, so um, in the last six months, I've had the opportunity to serve on a um, university-wide task force on arts research and practice. Mm -hmm. And what that task force was put together to do was basically um, similar to what the CSW was put together to do, which is to stand up for uh, um, the rights of a given um, slice of the community, right? CSW stands for uh, standing up for women uh, plus rights uh, and equity. And this arts task force at UGA was put together th through um, professors from every uh, arts department and humanities um, to, to uh, say we deserve the same um, research money as the STEM subjects, <laughs> which you know, at a research one university can be um, tricky. Right. Uh, and so, so a lot of the conversation focused on some of the same principles. And I recognize, wow, you know, I actually uh, is, is uh, unschooled as I felt joining this arts task force, because a lot of the people on the arts task force had much more, um, I'll say institutionalized, uh, grant writing experience, uh, institutionalized administrative experience. They knew the history of UGA better than I did. Um, all of those things, I felt very green in that regard, except I started to see parallels between the conversations we have on CSW about generating awareness and um, the need to amplify what we're doing the need to bring people in um, to share what we're doing and contribute to the conversation. Um, and so ultimately, in the end, there were um, too many things to ignore <laughs> in terms of the parallels between those experiences. Um, uh, and so uh, from there, um, I, have, um, I have joined several community um, groups, uh, not affiliated with a particular organization, but community groups focused on uh, racial equity um, and the racial divide that can exist not only in where I live in Athens, Georgia, but uh, certainly in the country, everything that we're, we're reckoning right now. And, um, and that's huge. And um, talk about a learning curve that I'm on as well as many of us. Right. So with with these parallels that you see, I mean, are you, do you feel like you're seeing progress? I mean, that, that the, the converse, important conversations are being had and that there's yeah. movement in those directions? <laughs> so isn't that the question, right? Is right. we can talk till we're blue in the face, but where's the action, right? Mm -hmm. And that can be a frustrating part of any university setting. That's uh, uh, academics are, uh, are especially known for all talk and, and slow action, if any action at all. Um, but the more you're involved in those conversations, actually, the more strength you begin to have to say enough talking. Right. <laughs> We've talked about this already. I talked about it on this committee and this committee, and I heard it here in this search committee, and I heard it here and this, uh, um, uh, and, uh, when you reach that point, um, the action starts to uh, um, 
you start to lead action because you are no longer tolerant of just talking about it. So, so I've noticed that significantly at, in my role at the university. Um, with CSW, uh, you know, it, um, so we're in our second term now. We're in, we operate in two-year terms. Mm -hmm. And so the first term uh, was simply about um, wrapping our heads around what we were charged to do and building a structure in which we could operate. So getting a website going, um, um, creating our bylaws, you know, we had to write our bylaws and run them through the executive committee at NASA to uh, gain approval and work with them on what they also, uh, what their feedback was. Um, and, uh, and, and, and figure out what NASA needed. You can't, you can't as a, as an advocacy group uh, of only eight people, <laughs> that's the size of the committee, um, speak for everybody. And so we, we went on a very serious pursuit to gain feedback from the membership. Once we gathered all that feedback, we be, it became clearer what, what action steps and what programs we needed to develop and, and further develop and where our efforts needed to be, uh, you know, where we needed to invest um, ourselves and our programs. And so um, where we're at right now from that feedback and also from the turnover of new membership on the committee, which happened um, last March, um, new membership on committees is always wonderful, by the way, because it's fresh voices um, being together as one body for too long, the same group of people can diminish creativity and diminish uh, your imagination. And um, you sort of, you know, sort of that herd mentality begins to take hold. Um, two years is, I'm not suggesting two years was enough with the first committee. <laughs> I'm not saying that <laughs> because that first <laughs> committee was also amazing. But, um, but um, when you bring in fresh voices uh, and we brought in four new voices onto a committee of eight, four of us remained on and four uh, rolled in. So um, anyway, where we are now, what we have identified is is various components that are critical to our success um, and the success of, of fighting for gender equity in, in NASA and beyond. Because our, our hope also is that everyone who learns more about this takes it into their own spaces, right? This cannot exist just in NASA because NASA is just a place for saxophonists. Right, right. so, so I, 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 was, I wanted to ask, um, what are, you know, this is a saxophone specific forum, obviously. I mean, what are some of the things you're really excited about? I'd, I'd love for you to talk specifically about the CSW yeah. and the initiatives that you're taking and, and, yeah. um, and so the, the mentoring program is, is big and we, we just launched our second iteration of it. Um, Jan Baker has done, um, really, really good work with, uh, the ad hoc committee that was formed, um, to help usher along the launch of the second program and turn including brainstorming and creating the new model of what it is. So, so very excited about that. Mm -hmm. Also super excited that some of the mentors this year are um, outside of NASA, you know, outside mm -hmm. people who, who otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't be affiliated with NASA. They're saxophone players and they care about the instrument, but, um, but this, this idea of bringing in other voices uh, to, uncover some of the deeper work that's possible. Um, I'm such an advocate of that. It goes into my belief in interdisciplinary stuff. And these people are not interdisciplinary in terms of they still play the saxophone, they're musicians, they care about advancing uh, the uh, experiences and the empowerment of women. But, um, but again, we, yeah, it widens the lens of what NASA could be. So uh, so that's something I, I feel very proud of um, that we're accomplishing. I also feel very proud of what the website is becoming. Um, mm -hmm. The website is, uh, we are periodically every couple of months launching something new that's valuable on the website. Um, uh, there's a small group of people who put together a feminist glossary. So anybody, uh, it's not specific to musicians or saxophonists or at NASA, um, anyone can go to our page and, and find a feminist glossary, which educates people. I learned terms on that list. And here I am, the co-chair of a women's committee. And I learned 
certain terms on that list that I did not know before. So this is the educational part. Um, we'll be putting up uh, a host of um, organizations and their mission statements very soon in the next month on, um, on uh, organizations and um, uh, funding opportunities specific to Women Plus. Um, we also will be, you know, we have a larger social media presence now, which brings visibility to um, all of these amazing women that are in our organization. And visibility is such a big thing in advocacy work, such a big thing. And so we have deliberately um, uh, increased our presence, created a presence and increased it. And that initiative is led by Nikki Roman, and she's doing a knockout job with that. Um, it's also about connecting people within the organization. And so I'm very proud of the, the webinars that we hosted, um, <laughs> much in the same way of this community that we're in right now with the, the Saxophone Studio Online group is that we connected um, each other at, a, an, at an important time. But maybe what I'm most proud of, um, those programs are all a part of this, but there is a new energy in NASA that I never experienced from the time I joined NASA, which when that was when I was in early my early years in college. There is a new energy, and that energy is coming from the connecting uh, relationships that we've uh, uh, now been actively doing for the past two years, um, not only between the Women Plus community and NASA, but also between the Women Plus community and the men in NASA um, because you need everybody for advocacy. <laughs> Women's plus advocacy cannot take place, gender advocacy cannot take place without allies and allies in this case would be men. So, um, so that's huge and the energy and the conversations that I get to experience now with other NASA members are uh, new, they're inspiring, they're uplifting, they're empowering, <laughs> they're motivating. <laughs> um, I could go on and on about that, but um, I noticed that, that women's voices are strong and they have a place now. Um, and that's, that's what I'm most proud of. And I think um, when, we were, when we were speaking back in, in May, um, one of the things that you had mentioned was just the fact that conversations like this are being had. Yeah. Just the very fact that that you know it, it's an awareness it's an awareness thing and that they can exist right and that they can it also exists safely you and i had some of that conversation when we were talking about um your the final um interview on the, on your series and it was you know uh sometimes all of us um might unknowingly dance around the topic, right? Dance around it because we're not sure what's okay to ask and what's not okay to ask. And did I do this okay? Did I not do this okay? Um, and I just love that we can so openly have this conversation. Um, and there are many uh, eager and well-equipped women plus in the organization uh, that we could <laughs> we could uh, engage with in this conversation. Um, and it's, it's very exciting to me. I just, I, I love the empowerment piece of it. Uh, Dr. Frigo, if I could yes. ask you a question. Um, yeah. I was really interested when you were discussing before about when you've been serving on panels and you've been serving on um, faculty organizations and the NASA committee to talk and discuss openly um, about actions that you can take forward um and you mentioned this like beautiful thing about how long are you going to talk about it and how long are you going to tolerate it right yes. and um <laughs> that spoke to me quite quite deeply to the tolerance part of it you know how long are you going to identify an issue within your community and how long are you going to sit on it or continue to discuss it or look at it from the left and the right and the center <laughs> so i wondered if you could um you know you could comment on some of the ways that when an issue has been identified within a community and you discuss it with maybe your peers your colleagues your you know fellow faculty how how can you move from talking to action on a, on a certain issue hmm. yeah that's such a good question and one i i have to also deliberately think about every intersection i find myself at when i'm at that spot um 
first of all is understanding where the authority lies right where does the authority lie um, so for instance um, I was on a recent um, uh, school of music committee um, uh, on innovation and uh, um, I was chairing that committee it was over the summer we saw that as an opportunity to um, maybe advance some of our innovative ideas into the into our programming for the fall semester since we're dealing with a pandemic and everything's upside down anyway so part of that conversation we had great ideas and we uh, were talking with our director who was incredibly supportive of everything we had put forward to him and I had to ask the question okay now who is ultimately accountable for the success of this project who is responsible for it because right now uh, you know we broke up into little teams and we had one team doing this programming and we had another team doing this and if like it has to be clear where the buck stops right it has to be clear because if it's not clear no one's gonna step up and actually see it through so as an individual I can certainly bring my best foot forward and say okay I'm gonna give my all to this but if ultimately I don't have the authority to actually change it and all that comes with that authority right what I might have to look at conversations I might have to have the decisions I might have to make then then we're just bogging it down so I think it's critical to establish who has the authority and if you realize that you actually at the end of the day don't have authority then you have to adjust your expectations and you um, uh, so that you're not like spinning your wheels for nothing because advocacy work can be very tiring and you can become exhausted and burned out from it um, if you keep spinning 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 so um, and if you're you're not if you're not ultimately where the authority lies you don't have the vote to make it happen you um, then you have to put forth your best recommendations as clearly as possible in a written form I believe that so deeply make a knockout report that you then put on someone's desk and say here's our recommendations here's our way ways forward what do we have your permission to do and that's that's where conversations start to move and then if ultimately something doesn't move it's not on your watch it's on whosoever desk it is to give permission or to vote it in or make the change happen on your behalf or your committee's behalf or the topic at hand Th th those two things have been critical in all of my recent work actually all of my recent advocacy work those two pieces have been very critical know where the authority is and write down your report uh, recommendations expectations very very clearly and the justification too right here's why we're asking yeah. for this here's the problem that we're all keep talking about here's how to get ourselves out of it <laughs> yeah thank you so yes. so once you've submitted your mm -hmm. your findings or your report or your action plan yeah <laughs> then if 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 and because we all know that this can also be the case then when it still doesn't move mm -hmm. and the needle that still doesn't move then what's the next step the next the, the next conversation to have at the point that it stopped is to say how serious were you about this after all mm. and does it become just an optical uh, um, illusion that you care about this you I'm not talking about a single person I'm talking about the the organization you're in the com the, the, the 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 program you're in the school of music you're in the College of Arts and Sciences that you're in um, the NASA organization that you're in you know whatever you might be the big big umbrella over you um, uh, if you have been tasked with something if you have been tasked to represent the rights or represent the the values of a certain thing um, how dare they ask you to do that without action right and so that's the conversation you have to have where is the action 
tell us if you don't want to move on these things this committee has so thoughtfully and carefully and deliberately put together. Uh, give us a response as to why this is not going to move. You mm -hmm. know, you, we, you owe that to us mm -hmm. to give us a response to why this is not going to move. So that's where it is. And again, you can only do what you can do. So, uh, but, but requesting um, a response to the report line by line uh, is one way to hold them accountable. And, mm -hmm. and for the record, um, whoever holds that authority, um, whether it's an executive committee or whether it's the director or dean of your program, uh, whoever holds that, it's their right to make decisions, right? But where we get into trouble all the time is that then, um, uh, then that level of support just seems performative. It can just feel performative. And that's, that's what I'm becoming um, so much more sensitive to now than I was even five years ago. Um, in part because of the climate of our country right now and all that we've experienced in this last six months, eight months. Um, but uh, so, so there's an intolerance now for it, but it's also super clear to me. Um, and, and if you do everything you can on your part as an advocate and uh, um, if it's a group of people, um, the best you can do after that is request the conversation that says, okay, please go line by line and help us understand why you're not supporting this, what you need from us in order to see this initiative through or whatever it is. Um, and don't be afraid to use the word performative, <laughs> performative yeah. support. Looks like you want to support it. You know, it's, it's, it's the, it's the, uh, it's the same thing that, uh, many of us are reckoning with right now, uh, regards regarding black lives matter, uh, and, and all the statements that went out, uh, by so many different organizations, um, about we unequivocally stand with you and support you and you matter as much as everything else. And then, uh, and then the lack of follow-up. Yeah. So, so then <clears throat> would you mind defining and, and, you know, you know, the performative versus operative uh, allyship or advocacy, you know, and what that yeah. means? Yeah. I mean, to me, the difference is action, the, the specific action, and it's not enough to care about it. It's not an, okay. So, so, so performative allyship, uh, advocacy and uh, allyship is tied to advocacy. And uh, so, but performative advocacy is saying you care about something, but not doing anything about it. Um, where advocacy, where you become an advocate is where you actually begin to put a part of yourself behind the cause. Um, and you take action and action can be so many different things. Action can be um, <laughs> returning a phone call. Action can be um, uh, communicating on, in a timely way when something is asked of you. Action can be donating money to uh, an organization or a cause you care about. Action can be um, protesting. Action can be joining a committee that cares about these rights. Action can be writing to an organization and saying, how can I help? I support you deeply and I don't know what to do. Um, um, so, so it can be so many things, but that's, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it, you know, w putting a statement out on social media saying you support and then and then not putting action behind it is performative. Yeah, social media really is. Oh, very, very, very tricky with this. Yes, it is. It is very uh, tricky. One of the things that that. It's hard to know, you know, if an event happens you know, and, 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 and people speak out about that event on social media. I, I guess my question is, and because there's a, little, a bit of a blurred line here, maybe, and, and, and please correct me if, if you think I'm, I'm wrong, but if somebody says, I, I can't believe this, this is terrible, and they're drawing attention to it, is, is that strictly performative or because we've seen examples where on social media where people were unaware of something before and then they became aware of it and then something happened out of it. So I, I'm, it's very confusing to me at times and maybe part of it is timing. 
you know, if, if you're on the front end versus the back. And I, do you have any opinion on that? Because this is like the a very gray area, I think. Yeah, so um, being informed is a huge part of advocacy, being informed. Um, I will be very honest in saying that prior to um, the CSW, prior to joining the CSW uh, and the movement that has become, I would not have called myself an advocate for equal rights of women plus. Why could I not call myself an advocate of that? I cared about it. I certainly cared about it. Uh, I had experiences of, of, um, of sexism. Oh my gosh, I have experiences of sexism. I have um, other examples of very inappropriate things that have happened to me uh, in the professional world, um, as many women have. Um, but I was not putting forth myself into a conversation as well as into a form of action that could have changed any of that, except when it happened to me, right? And when it happened to me, I would certainly speak up and I might affect the culture of the place that it happened in. Mm -hmm. However, I was not a part of the larger conversation about gender equity. I was a part of the conversation that only came right across my eyes, not a part of the conversation in order to support all of the women plus in the music world or whatever community I may belong in. So, so I could not have fairly called myself an advocate prior to that. Um, if someone had wanted to engage me in the conversation or tried to and said earlier, you know, uh, I notice, you know, you, uh, you're a minority, uh, you're in a gender minority in your field. Uh, what do you think about that? In the past, prior to CSW, I just would have said, I don't know what to think about it because that's all I know, right? It's, I don't know anything else, actually. Um, so, so it's advocacy. I don't know. I think advocacy happens when you when when um, when it goes outside of yourself and and you become for a cause, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean that anyone who might sort of say, yes, I care about that too. It's not a, it's not a slight against that person at all, but recognize that advocacy takes action and, and, and maybe the question isn't big enough yet for someone to actually like jump in, you know, yeah. um, maybe it's not big enough for them yet. The question that they're asking and wondering about. Sure. Ellie, do you? Yeah, I have a I have a comment that I just in regards to advocacy and, and social media in particular. And one example that I think is a really important example in the recent past of how sharing issues on social media have actually been really helpful for the course was the great F1 J1 visa debacle mm -hmm. of July 2020. Right. right. Um, so many of your colleagues and maybe your students within your tax payment departments are international students. Um, and maybe in the past, not a lot of thought has gone on about how they got there, right? And if you haven't spent half of your life on the phone with Homeland Security, like, mm. it's a it's a wild and wonderful thing to experience. Um, but but one of the things that happened when you know those issues came in, I I won't go into the depth of details. A quick Google will help you find out what happened in July 2020 if you want to suss it out. Is that you know actually the the uh, the the liberty that international students were going to be able to have within their learning in the states was going to be retracted, right? It was they were going to have less uh, less opportunity to stay in the country, stay in school. Um, and the first thing that people say is, that, okay, well you've got to call your congressman, okay, mm -hmm. or you've got to call your senator, you've got to call this person, call the other person. Um, and I'm I don't have a vote here. I don't, you know, I'm not a citizen. Um, that's the whole point of being on that scheme. And actually, I think by a few of us sharing with our 
uh, student community about the, the kind of restrictions that were going on in place actually caused really positive uh, actions from the people that read those posts because you know we kind of said hey this this thing is going on can you support us can you help us can you advocate on behalf of us because I can call my embassy um, I can call the home office in Britain or whatever country you're from but you know I can't act on on you know I, I'm limited you in the way that I can act yes. yeah exactly yes. exactly so I think that actually um, I I know a significant amount of my colleagues phoned their various senators in their various states on, on my behalf and or our behalf you know, on behalf of their colleagues and friends that were facing this kind of um, you know significant change in their status and that was a time I think that it was a real force for good I don't think it always acts that way but it did work that way in that time I think yeah, and that speaks to the value of being informed, right? Um, it might, that particular issue um, resonated because those people who came up and became advocates care about you. And, and you were, a, 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 a tan you and many others, were a tangible um, reason for someone to start caring about it, right? To, to, so, so being informed and whatever that might look like. It could look like social media. It could look like um, um, uh, uh, an organization that forms around the cause. It could look like um, uh, a book club. I mean, it could look like so many different things about how to become better informed and amplify what it is, vis visibility and amplification of the message, right? And the channels that that can operate through are vast. Um, and I'm thrilled that that was a force for good, <laughs> Ellie. <laughs> um, but it speaks to the, the value of um, the community that's needed for advocacy, right? Um, it, you, can't, you can't do advocacy by yourself. Well, you'll, yeah, it, yeah it's about, it's about the movement. It's about people joining forces. Mm -hmm. And Ellie, this was the, the administration was going to remove residency status for students if their courses went online, correct? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. And it's um, part of the deal, right? <laughs> part of the deal when you show up as an international student is that you have to uh, promise that you're going to have a full-time course load and that um, at least uh, I think it's at least six of those credits are going to be in person. Okay, there's a very small amount that you can take online classes, and and that's always been the deal, right? That's, that's right. we signed up from that right from the beginning. Um, but the ability for especially small universities to uh, um, provide in person, a hundred percent in person learning during a global pandemic, is something that the you know, <laughs> hasn't, hasn't come up before. And um, there was a period in the spring semester where uh, leniencies were made that we could go 100% online and, and continue our status. Um, there was a injunction by the current administration to remove that right in July, 2020. Uh, um, I think it was Yale or Harvard University had already um, stated that they were gonna be fully online and they were gonna lose a huge amount of their student population and income. Um, and it took them about three minutes in the law, in in the courtroom to decide that it was unjustified and was removed. Right, and rightly so. Um, so, how do how does one go from caring about something, um, being vocal about something, uh, to actually being an advocate, like being active in that role? Um, I think the simplest answer to that is you have to show up. You have mm -hmm. to show up to the conversation and what that conversation is. And I, I'm, I'm using conversation as sort of the, uh, a very broad, you have to show up um, uh, if you care about, um, uh, if, 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 if your passion and your belief is in supporting uh, gender equity, then, then look at your community, your immediate community around you, and does something exist that you can join already? That's, that's doing work 
advocacy work in that regard. Um, if it doesn't exist, is it worth it? Is it needed? Worth it meaning because there's a need. Mm -hmm. Is there a need for it? And should you start something? So I'll give you an example of that. Um, at the University of Georgia School of Music, uh, a wonderful group of students just started a uh, anti-racism committee. Um, and part of the their charge is they put a wonderful descriptor in the title of their organization, which is actionable anti-racism and inclusion, which means they are not interested in sitting around and talking. <laughs> um, they want to talk to understand the issues and, 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 and give people a safe place, um, especially underrepresented students, a safe place to talk. But um, in such a short amount of time, they have designed a website with valuable resources. They have written their, their bylaws. They have gotten permission from the director to exist as an official committee. They have joined, two of the members have joined the faculty uh, DEIB committee. Um, and they're off and running. And now they are having conversations. They've never thought possible in all of their years of music training. Um, they're being seen for the first time. And so they saw a need for this because a few of them uh, who had this idea at first, one of them is an underrepresented, he's in an underrepresented community. And they saw the need for this and said, I've never felt like there was even a place for this conversation to exist. And they're off and running already. So it's an example of how to go from caring to doing. And that's just one example. Um, uh, for students who may not be in a position or anyone who may not be in a position to, to launch a committee like this or may not have the time or whatever, just do a little bit of digging and see what exists that you can join. Um, the, the informing part, the self-informing part is really big. Um, I can't say enough about the, co the, the continual learning that has to take place. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's eternal, right? It's sort of, I mean, for those of us who are kind of avid learners to begin with, it's, it's, it's a huge thing and you think, wow, I don't know enough to actually contribute meaningfully to this. And the truth is you have to show up. And if you don't know enough, you can learn. Um, you are not going to be criticized for showing up and not knowing anything. You will be uh, missing a huge opportunity if you don't show up. So, so, uh, um, you have to determine what you can show up to, you know, what exists in the community around you or maybe at the national level of an organization. Um, um, but it's actually not that hard to start conversations with other people around a common interest or a common, um, uh, especially if you're marginalized in any way. Um, there's other, so many other people who who will uh, relate to and relate to what you're talking about and um, want to be connected. It could start small. It could start with 10 people meeting on a Zoom once a month about something that, that matters. Then it just evolves from there. It really does. Great. Um, so you already mentioned uh, the anti-racism uh, uh, committee at UGA. Mm -hmm. um, but so, you know, what are some things students or faculty can do, you know, to really begin um, thinking about this and shaping their projects? I mean, so one, one of the one of the issues that that we also talked about was actually the curriculum itself, yeah. the repertoire itself. Like, do uh -huh. you, you know, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I love the uh, shaping projects. I think that's a great way to frame it, first of all, because um, for many, many years, our <laughs> the shapes of our projects looked pretty similar. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, once in a while, something uh, out of the box would, would happen. Um, 
and and of course now with, with social media um we we know uh there's a lot there 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 can be um easy access to what is going on around the country and the world and um shaping projects so um at a at a school level i mean you have to you know you have to determine what your values are if if your values in in this case of of um uh being better and more inclusive about what music is played and performed and studied and amplified um there's a lot of research that has to be done right but the first step would be to make a new public statement right a new sort of uh, um, commitment to uh, doing mm -hmm. the following things um, but uh, you know I'm not in any position the sort of I don't I, I'm not in any leadership role at the school in that way so um, I just know from this DEIB committee that the, that's something we're working on we're also working on um, how we can better serve uh, um, students that may come from under-resourced populations and make it easier for them to be accepted into our school of music. That involves a lot of things that aren't worth getting into in this in this conversation. But um, but when you look at the hurdles that exist to for entry and acceptance into a school of music, let alone a university, um, uh, there are many for for marginalized communities, and so so that's a big thing we're looking at right now. And it's nothing we can solve overnight but we're taking the time to, to dig and to understand the various layers. Um, so in terms of like, now I'm speaking as a performer, um, uh, from a performer standpoint, um, and also somebody who helps a lot of young students um, shape their own projects and helps a lot of young students begin to discover their artistic identity. That takes a long time too, but we certainly begin to do that work even as undergraduates. Um, an example I wanted to share is actually a project that I commissioned a year ago and uh, to me represents like, like I, I, if I commission no other projects the rest of my life, I will be satisfied with this one. <laughs> um, and it was, it was uh, the commissioning of Kevin Day to write more than words, um, which uh, we could, Ellie, could you put that the link to that YouTube video in the in the chat yeah, of just course. for people to take? Um, but anyway, Kevin Day is a uh, young man from Texas, actually, <laughs> um, and he uh, I first learned of Kevin in November of 2018 when um, I was at a wind ensemble concert and our wind ensemble director here um, programmed one of Kevin's wind ensemble pieces called. Um, uh, dancing fire and uh, heard the piece it was wonderful uh, super high energy and wonderful and then Kevin uh, stands up to talk about it and it was then that we knew first of all how young he was he was still in college <laughs> and secondly um, that opportunity just November 2018 not even two years ago was his first guest composer appearance it was the first time he was paid to show up somewhere on behalf of his music. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was very special to begin with. Then last, fast forward six or seven months, and I learned that Kevin is going to be coming to UGA for his master's degree in composition. So I was thrilled about that. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, he got to meet faculty and he got to meet, he got to know the program. I texted him, emailed him, sorry, emailed him, and just said, I know, you know, you're moving to Athens and I would love to commission you to write a saxophone octet piece uh, or saxophone ensemble. I don't even remember what I said initially, but I want spoken word with it um, because I had been involved in another piece using spoken word uh, a year before that uh, called Charlottesville with um, some colleagues of mine at UGA, um, one of whom is our percussionist professor and percussion professor and composer and it was a piece he wrote to come to terms with his emotional reaction to the charlottesville unite the right rally in 2017. 
And I was very taken with that um, spoken word on top of contemporary music and who the music might be able to reach that maybe otherwise wouldn't reach audiences it might not reach otherwise. Because when you think about audiences who come for new, uh, new music or contemporary music, often those audiences are very different than those who might come for something related to um, uh, social activism or something, social justice, something along those lines. So Kevin and I got talking. He, he said, yes, I'm in. We moved to Athens. We started talking. I knew that I wanted to premiere the work at NASA in March. And um, I told him about this spoken word part for me and why that was so important. And he said, uh, who's going to write the spoken word part? And I said, well, I've got someone in my studio who um, I want to uh, uh, have her write it. I also want her to be the narrator um, because she's a saxophonist, but boy, she has a strong voice. Uh, and that was a project I knew she could get behind. So the plans were set. Um, Kevin wrote the piece. We were all grappling with what the subject matter would be. Um, and ultimately, the, uh, between Karina, who was the spoken word uh, narrator, and Kevin, um, Kevin basically wrote about his observances of the world uh, from his view as a young black man um, from Texas, um, grappling with his various parts of what he's seeing around him um, as he's emerging as his own person and uh, his own artistic identity through his compositions. And so, so um, the piece is remarkably personal. Um, what's most remarkable about it is it was written before May <laughs> when the country, you know, the lid on our country's racism blew open. The piece could have been written just as well with the same words post May, <laughs> but it was written prior. So it's such a deep example of what happens when you create space for a young person or uh, in this case, a musician to use that medium to share what's on the inside to to that moment to date kevin said that was the most personal piece he had ever written and it was the first time he showed that part of himself to the world um so when i say that if i commission nothing else for the rest of my life i will be fulfilled i mean that very very sincerely um so what ingredients did that take well it took me or somebody being the organizer of, of something, right? I had a vision to say, I want to support the music of Kevin Day. I want to get my students involved. I want it to be interactive. I want it to be collaborative. And I want it to result in a powerful experience for everybody. Kevin also played piano with us, which then is special because then the composer is playing piano and you know, when we all get a new piece of music, it's it's nice to have the composer in the ensemble mm -hmm. <laughs> for all the questions we have. And did you mean this? Or is this OK? Can we shift this here? And so we did a little bit of that once we got the piece in January. Um, so it took organizing. It also takes, you know, like really digging into who you are, like 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 look at. Look at what feels important to you, if you're if you're wanting to work with a composer, what, like why, first of all, why that composer and, and, and what meaning do you want to bring to this piece of music? What message do you want in the piece of music? When that happens, the amount of people you can reach with the music is so much more than when you don't give that kind of thought to the process. And, and I'm just really proud of, well, I'm, Deeply proud of Kevin, first of all, for um, having the courage and also along the way saying with, you know, sort of uh, bated breath saying, boy, I don't know who this is going to piss off. I don't know who's going to hate this. And to that, I said, I don't I don't personally care who hates this and I don't care who gets turned off. 
um, but you've got a whole army of people behind you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you don't need to worry about that. So um, I would encourage anyone um, who who is shaping their own projects right now to get the people involved that that can fill in all those roles, you know, like fill in the roles even of like, like it felt really important to me to ask my student Karina to be the narrator. Why did I know that? Because I've seen her, um, well, I know her very well, first of all. I also know uh, what makes her tick. I also know what she's afraid of. And so it was an opportunity for me to say, you know what? This will be a very, very good role for you. Um, and from there, uh, choosing the players to be involved was, yeah, an audition process because I couldn't host everybody. You know, everybody couldn't be a part of it. So, um, so yeah. And that converse, you know, Kevin's piece now makes new conversations happen. That's sure. just, it's beautiful. I can watch that video. I can watch it every day and have probably watched it nearly a hundred times since April. And I don't tire of it. It's gonna. It's timeless. The message is timeless. That's that's great. And you shared that, Ellie. You shared the the link. And 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 Connie, I think you shared that what yesterday or two days ago. Mm -hmm. I shared it yesterday. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just it's just a special piece of music. It was a special project, and um, and the strength and empowerment that it gives a lot of people who were involved in it is uh, is it's very it, yeah meaningful. So I, I want to put out a, a call to everybody. If you do have questions for Dr. Frigo, please type them in the chat. Um, I do have one more question for you. And that's mm. actually, what are the problems? What are the difficulties with advocacy in this, in this charge that you give yourself? What are the things that you run up against that, that you find to be challenging? And how, how do you try to move past them? Um, yeah, so when you're kind of when you're sitting in the thick of advocacy work for anything, um, like you feel like your pants are on fire, <laughs> you know, you feel like everything is very urgent. And if this doesn't, if this doesn't get done tomorrow, then uh, a we're not doing our job well enough, or b there's going to be, you know, dire consequences. And so, um, so having patience is is uh, a challenge. Um, because when you get the momentum started and you get the movement started, um, anything that stands in the way of blocking that energy is a problem. It's a problem for the people who are investing in the cause. Um, it's deflating. It's, it's exhausting, um, which is actually sometimes part of what the system wants it to be for you so that you back off. So there's deep systemic problems uh, you know, uh, fighting for the many causes. Um, so burnout is uh, a challenge. Uh, having enough patience to deal with the people who are in the chairs to make decisions is a problem. Um, getting those people to come to the conversation openly and not defensively is a problem. Um, And yeah, so those are probably, in my experience, the three biggest hurdles, mm. um, as well as the, the hurdle I talked about already, which is you do all this work uh, on behalf of uh, an organization or a school of music or a university that, that, or a community organization that, that you've been charged to do, and then it sits without the without being granted permission right. and, and, and radio silence from the people who can make the decisions. That's incredibly hard to deal with. Right. And frustrating, frustrating is a very kind word to, to call it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's the, 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 the defeating, deflating part of it um, is very real, um, especially when you know the people, especially when you know the people that you're advocating for. When when actual people become involved versus just a blind look at a slice of the population, when actual people, when you can say, this person, are you comfortable not supporting this person who you know? <laughs> um, that's that's when it just becomes painful. It's It can be really hard work. Yeah. Well, I just 
on a, on a personal note, I, I really, I, I love hearing um, your thoughts on this. I, I am somebody who uh, I would very much, like I, I personally care about a lot of issues, but I am also kind of an introspective and, and certainly an introvert, especially when it comes mm. to my public face on, on social media. I, I have not been yeah. nearly, I mean, this, you give me a lot to think about and I've learned a lot from this because it gives me a lot to think about in terms of my intention behind things. And I just specifically have not, I don't feel like been vocal enough when I could be, mm. but I, it's not my nature. So like the battle between my nature and oh. versus what I feel like the best thing to do is very, yeah. well. Well, I, I hear you. I totally do, Nate. And, and I, um, I'm not, uh, I'm so selective with what I choose to post on social media. I always have been. Um, it's not, a, uh, it's just, you know, we, yeah. So I'm with you on social media for that alone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I have a, you know, a definitely, I, I don't have a love-hate relationship with social media because I don't love any part of it. <laughs> but... <laughs> I have a, a tolerant slash hate relationship with right. social media. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but uh, let's, you know, uh, this would be the part of the conversation where I would say, you know what, there, there's, there's spaces for you to operate within to show your advocacy support of, of things. So I would like to, uh, you and I have no problem having <laughs> long, lengthy right. conversations that weave all over the map. And so let's yes. have another one of those um, very soon over the phone. And, um, and uh, I would love to talk about it, not because I have answers, but because I don't want anyone who wants to show um, compassion for and start to uh, with intentions um, have some kind of action I don't want you to feel like you don't know where to go so you know yeah I, you know and one of the things that I, I've, I've maybe we could talk about and we don't have to have this in front of everybody but what I'm happy to is is um, learning how to um, for me my my support has has generally been donating money and or writing to a senator or something like that um but i think the visibility part of it is 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 an important component mm -hmm. um and that's you know learning how to to do that in a way that's operative that that is also showing this support in a meaningful way that yeah. isn't just saying i support this um yeah is is my struggle I, I should also mention specific to the CSW in NASA, um, we have uh, one of the new initiatives, uh, and this is uh, has everything to do with our new member, Jonathan Hulting Cohen. He's leading an allyship team um, uh, specific to to uh, gender equity, and so so very soon they have been hard at work since I don't know what month May I think June maybe June. Um, and uh, they have been meeting regularly. They are rolling out some programs very soon. And so uh, it could be, yeah, there could be a place for you. That allyship uh, specific to CSW is in, you know, is specifically for men. <laughs> um, and so uh, we will, um, and it, I say it's specifically for men because men would be the allies of, of women plus, um, uh, but, um, it's going to be all inclusive in terms of who's involved uh, with the actual program. So, so more will be coming soon on that. And I, I'm certain you will find something to attach to with that. Right. I'm certain of it. Yeah. Awesome. And I would just, I just want to say really quickly to be a visible, you know, to, to visibly help, it does not have to occur on social media, like at all, oh, I am. you know, and I think that, um, actually being a visible advocate of anything could just be like a casual conversation with your colleagues. What did you do this weekend? Oh, well, actually I am committed to this organization. I helped out at this thing. I spent time emailing. I think just being, it, it doesn't have to occur as a post, you know, it can occur just in casual conversation with your students, with your colleagues with your friends, like whoever, it doesn't only have to occur in this one way. Yeah, it can, it can occur also just by connecting people, right? It, that's sure. a huge part of it too. Yeah, that's a great, great way to say that, Ellie. 
And, and Daniel said, he did say visible support can empower others to feel comfortable sharing the same concern, which can snowball, which is, you know, a very yeah. powerful part of it for sure. Yeah. So, um, well, okay. If there are no other questions, uh, I think this, oh, oh, we <laughs> um, this is from Grace. Ah, Grace uh, with is Kevin's mind. piece, there was a question as to who might disagree with the piece and its message. And you stated that you don't particularly care who might disagree. For early career emerging musicians, striking a balance between taking a stand as an advocate on controversial issues and being aware who, of who might disagree or, or how those disagreements might impact your career can be challenging. What advice do you have? This is a fantastic question. I mean, especially, you know, in a, in a, especially in a polarized climate. Um, that's a great question. Do you have any advice on that? Yeah, it's such a big question. Um, <laughs> um, this will sound very simple. Um, because I believe in some ways it is simple. Um, if you're showing your heart and you are representing yourself if that is controversial then the people who are taking issue with it don't belong in your circle so if you know I, I, I hate the fact that it could feel threatening to someone's higher ability um, I'd like to think it wouldn't <laughs> um, but then again, I also, I do firmly believe um, if you are not being yourself and are not able to be yourself when you are interviewing or when you are um, developing your artistic identity or taking the chances, taking the risks that, that um, are required to develop your artistic identity, then um, you wouldn't want to be linked with those people. <laughs> you wouldn't want to go work in a program of any kind that didn't value you, that didn't value who you were and didn't value what your heart is. Um, that doesn't mean it's easy and it doesn't mean you might, I mean, I, 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 it doesn't mean you might not feel resistance along the way, but boy, when you're thinking about where you might want to work and where you and who you might want to be around to be your system of support, a, a, a community that will hold who you are, um, truly hold you, <laughs> um, it's worth chasing that until you feel comfortable that you know you've been hired for you. That's, 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 that's my answer for that. Um, it's to empower you. I think that's a brilliant answer. And, 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 and it is a, it is a, it's a scary um, thing to, to, uh, to trust your, to, to trust yourself and, and to stay true to yourself in the midst of what might seem like resistance or what might seem like, you know, judgment of some kind. Yeah. One of the, um, I, I, a, a quote that I come back to very often that I was told by um, a very dear uh, friend and somewhat of a spiritual guide to me said, uh, you will know when it's time to leave any given place you are when that place can no longer hold who you are. And what that means is sometimes you outgrow a place. Sometimes you outgrow an activity you're doing. Sometimes you outgrow how you've always done things because whatever you happen to learn, you, the evolution of, of what you've learned and, and what inspired you recently made you uh, kind of tilt your head and say, wait a second, if I can't do that in my current community or place of employment or whatever, or where I'm living, I mean, it can be, I'm not talking about only employment here, where you're living, where you're working, who you're working with. If that place can no longer hold you for all that you are, you need to look elsewhere. That's that's time to move on. Yeah, and I would just say, Grace, I think that's a, it's a question that um, 
that I've thought a lot about with my own career as I move forward and I would I wholeheartedly agree with everything that Dr. Frigo said but I would I would just want to say to you that you're not the only person with those fears and not the only person with those feelings and concerns um and uh yeah I think it's something that a, a, we have a lot of concerns about but I I truly feel if you don't like it I'm not going to change so so I think that you know we just move on <laughs> great well I really really enjoyed hearing your both your thoughts on this and 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 learning from you about all this I, I think it's so it's it's never been more important mm. than right now well, I shouldn't say never but you know I, I, I yeah I understand totally that I catch myself saying the same thing it's like why wasn't it important before well you know let's not beat ourselves up over that it it, it uh yeah it's but urgent it's it urgent. urgent and and many of us have woken up to that yeah well thank you so much connie thank, thank you so you. much ellie and uh, i'll i'll post this for those for those who missed it and um hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend okay thanks bye Hi, everybody. We're back uh, with a surprise addendum to this. Uh, Connie wrote me this morning saying that uh, she would really love to mention a couple of initiatives she's been working on and is really proud of. So, Connie, take it away. Thank you, Nate. Thanks so much for this chance to circle back to a few things that we talked about yesterday that um, for whatever reason didn't come to the front of my mind as, as things I, I should have used as, a, as an examples of um, uh, using or how to shape projects to support advocacy of a certain kind. Um, so I want to circle back to the visibility piece that we talked about, sort of the, the, the criticalness of visibility and amplification of a message. Uh, whether it be for gender equity or uh, racial justice or any number of things. Um, on the CSW, uh, one of the projects that we are incredibly proud of is a community engagement project. And we announced this at the NASA conference. And uh, at that time, we, it was just a proposal. Uh, but since then, it has been funded by NASA. And what the project is, is um, the uh, creation of a new work by Roshan Erezadi that's going to be written for middle school band and professional saxophone soloist. Um, and where we got this idea was that, um, I think I told you our first two years of CSW, we were very much um, in listening mode, building and listening. Um, and so one of the things we did often was to solicit feedback. What, what, does, what do we need to be doing on behalf of NASA members? Um, and when we made our presentation at every NASA regional conference to gather this feedback, uh, all 10 regions uh, cited two things. The first is that NASA needs to be doing more uh, community engagement with younger people, middle school, high school people. Right. And that's something NASA's talked about for a long time, but it came up again. Uh, and the other big piece is that specific to women, there is a, a decline at every step of the way that a student may choose or not choose to continue on music. And so middle school, there's not really a problem um, in terms of gender representation of people playing the saxophone. High school, not so much of a problem. It drops off a little bit in college, drops off significantly in graduate school. Uh, masters and DMA then by the time you get to DMA it's dropped off a lot um, and then of course that has an effect into our profession who pursues saxophone as a profession um, so we come up with this proposal to have um, uh, to have uh, Roshan write a piece uh, for middle school band the first two years of the piece will be uh, the, uh, members of NASA who are women or gender non-binary, gender non-conforming, will have exclusive rights to playing the piece for two years. Any NASA member that fits those genders 
What this means is that for two years, beginning in fall of 2021, mm -hmm. middle school bands across the country have the potential of seeing women soloists playing with their band. Uh, the piece will be free to all players mm -hmm. and all bands. NASA has funded the project, which wow. we were very grateful for. The contract didn't uh, get signed until I don't honestly remember when at this point, sometime early summer, perhaps, maybe in the middle of the summer, I forget. Um, but so for two years, uh, so any um, uh, one, woman plus will be able to book a performance of this with any middle school band that's willing to do it. Then the following two years, the project is open to all genders in NASA. Mm. also free wow <laughs> yeah wow. this is a huge um it's it's a huge accomplishment first of all but the impact the layers of impact right. will be deep yeah. um which is another part of the equation you can't you know to really impact change you cannot just do a one-off thing right you know yeah. and yeah so that the, the I agree. I mean, that what what a perfect example of visibility, and 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 especially um, at such a young age. I mean, I I think that's that's a really important um, time, a really formative years for for everyone, obviously. And so to be able to see soloists, you know, um, you know, women plus, it's that's an amazing amazing initiative. So that's very cool. Yeah, by a woman composer, right. uh, which in the program notes and also the story that we tell with each performance um, to the audience as well as to the band that any of us might be working with, mm -hmm. um, it's an uplifting story. And right. it's going to put visibility of uh, Women Plus in front of um, so many eyes and ears um, at so many levels. Um, and so we are thrilled that it's going to be four year exclusivity for NASA members that um, when we talked a little bit yesterday about um, what are the opportunities for allyship, mm -hmm. um, having all genders play this for two years after the first two years is uh, a wonderful opportunity for allyship. Um, to continue to promote the piece, to continue to promote the story of the piece, to promote uh, Roshan Edazadi as a composer, mm -hmm. um, and to promote NASA also. And this is yeah. going to create visibility on so many levels, uh, which, as we know, the, 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 the statement that goes around so often is, I, I didn't know I could actually do that because I don't see role models looking like me in that sure. position. Um, and so anyway, we're, we're very proud of that. There is going to be a formal announcement coming out soon uh, that uh, Carrie Kaufman will make. Carrie was the lead uh, organizer of this and the, the person who saw it through from the idea all the way until the contract was able to be signed. And so she's going to be making the announcement and um, oh, we're just, we're just very excited. Uh, the deadline got pushed back because of COVID-19. It was supposed to actually be um, coming out this spring initially. And uh. anyway, fingers crossed that, you know, we can move forward with plans for a release in um, uh, or uh, parts in hand uh, next uh, one year from now. And, and so and so at the announcement, will there be information for people you know to about the, like um one of the you know issues that everybody will need is you know grade level and and yeah in terms of difficulty and how to sell how to market that to local band directors or people they may know yep we're gonna have a whole set of guidelines produced um uh so that it's as easy as possible to do especially for uh, young professionals who may be uh, just getting their feet wet with booking performances for themselves. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the obvious things for, we thought about is, well, go back to your your own middle school and see what it's like, you know, to to uh, 
go back and perform with them on this yeah. very special project. And so we're going to have um, guidelines. Uh, the parameters of the piece are written out in the contract. I think the piece is going to be four to six minutes long. Mm -hmm. You know, all the things that a middle school band, a good middle school band piece needs to satisfy. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's something big coming on the horizon. And as we develop our further resources around allyship also, that's going to be something we talk about a lot um, in this piece because it's a good example of it. Um, another example of it could be somebody like you having a graduate student, uh, a, a woman plus graduate student who might be in a position to perform the solo and you doing everything you can to to help her do so. You know, right. I mean, that's that's an act of allyship, let alone uh, what happens when when uh, all genders are able to play it. In sure. the final third and fourth year. Absolutely, that's very cool. I I I had heard um, rumblings of that, but I, I wasn't I, because I wasn't the last NASA. I, yeah. I was aware that an announcement yeah. was made. So that's great. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's one of those things that you know the conversation literally started. It would have been in the spring of 2019 because that's when we did all those regional uh, presentations and got all this valuable feedback to say, all right. It, talk about it's time to act. Uh, sure. It's time right. to act, you know, right. uh, uh, for years, NASA, we, we, we hear at the general membership meetings and we hear uh, in many other conversations, how do we reach younger pe people over and over again? And this, uh, we're so confident that this is a, a very substantial way to do so. I, I would, I would think so. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So that was the one thing I wanted to circle back to. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to do so. Uh, the other thing I wanted to circle back to was uh, another project that um, is being formed as we speak. And it is uh, a project that I'm involved in uh, and leading, co-leading with uh, the director of bands here at UGA. Her name is Dr. Cynthia Johnston Turner. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are uh, kindred spirits when it comes to creative projects and where our, our mind wants to explore. And uh, we tend to see things that aren't being done and we think, how can we do that? Right. <laughs> um, and we also care, uh, we're, um, we're aligned a lot on social values and, and how we, as a university, a major university in a huge college town um, needs to be bridging um, relationships with the community in a more substantial way. Again, universities have a tendency to throw around the word community engagement very lightly uh, without substantial investment and without substantial effort. Mm -hmm. And so it might be one concert that they think is community engagement. And, and the truth is community engagement needs roots. It needs building of relationships. It needs long-term vision it needs a ton of time <laughs> not playing your instrument uh, as you build these relationships and so we are getting our feet very wet with this we have aligned with the athens hip-hop community and we hmm. are involved in a very substantial project that also was postponed because of covid 19. Um, uh, but it's okay because what we're what it can build into actually is more long term than what we were originally thinking, sure. which is the part of it. So, so um, ad community engagement advocacy or advocacy for the marginalized com uh, communities in your own town or city um, uh, requires a lot of different disciplines to come together to assist. If if if. If Cindy and I went by ourselves um, on behalf of uh, just music, <laughs> um, yeah. uh, we would be missing something, first of all. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, we need more resources, right? Sure. And so, right. so the question we posed to ourselves as we ventured on this, this was one year ago we started talking about this and began meeting with the hip hop community, was, what does it look like if our UGA composers collided with hip hop composers mm. and they co-composed music for wind ensemble and saxophone with a saxophone feature and a hip hop artist being featured. 
And from there, the conversation has become so rich. Um, it's one of those conversations that, that makes you like smile and say, oh my gosh, <laughs> what could this look like? Yeah. Um, and so what we've uncovered, uh, so we reached out to the hip hop community, first of all, and to do so, we, we, re we reached out to our interdisciplinary office here at UGA because um, that, that the role of that office is to um, connect you to any field, any person, uh, any community member that may be interested in your artistic project. Mm -hmm. um, and so we involved the office is called Ideas for Creative Exploration, called ICE. We involved ICE immediately, and we said, "Who should we? Who should we, you know, be contacting?" And some of our contacts were people we had known a few years ago from this Charlottesville project we did in town with some community members. Mm -hmm. And so we weren't to we weren't starting out totally from scratch. Um, but what we so 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 there's there's community engagement advocacy. There's um, advocacy for the university to do what they say they're going to do, which is support the community. Um, UGA has a, 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 a tough past with the with marginalized communities. I'll just mm -hmm. put it that way in, in Athens without needing to go sure. into detail. So we had we had to learn a lot. First of all, Cindy and I did. Um, and we also had to realize um, what uh, budget we would need um, to support all of these hip hop artists we were asking to be a part of our um, our, our project. Um, and so questions we had to ask ourselves, you know, advocacy work involves questions. It, you can't just, you, you, you have to ask questions because a lot of times you don't know the, you don't know what you're walking into. Right. And we certainly know university life. We know university music life. We know the classical music scene, but we do not know the hip hop scene mm. or the hip hop culture um, and not personalized to Athens either. So, so we had to ask questions. What's in it for us? We had to ask the hip hop artists, why are you interested in this? And we have to come back to that often when we start to feel like we are the ones driving the show. We mm -hmm. don't want to be the drivers. We want to be the co-collaborators. Right. And so we have to take a step back often and, and literally ask them, okay, what's in it for you? You still are, are you still interested in the artistic collaboration? Uh, what can we be doing better? You know, mm -hmm. what are we not doing? Um, and so the one thing I want to stress to everyone who wants to uh, get into advocacy work of any kind, and I'm, I'm living it, very much through this project is the amount of time it takes to do things you simply don't have to do in our normal way of life and living in the academic music world right. and the classical sort of concert music world that right. we're used to. Um, to plan a concert, we obviously can do that in our sleep. We know what to expect. We know what venues to approach. We know who to call. We know how to prep. We know what music would be suitable. We actually essentially know our general audience. You know, I, I, I typically know the kind of person who's going to come and see one of my faculty recitals. Sure. But this was all kinds of different questions, so much so that we had to learn that the hip hop community was not interested in performing in our concert hall. Right. And, and aside from beautiful acoustics that a concert hall has, uh, it's not a welcoming environment for the hip hop community. And so we then had to look uh, at other venues that would be more psychologically accessible to the community we want at these concerts, uh, which is going to put all of us into venues we typically don't play in. Mm -hmm. um, f uh, a wind ensemble concert or a small chamber concert or something. So. So we are still a ways away from being able to produce a concert. Uh, the music in, in the moment is being written. The composers have been paired with a hip hop artist. The music is underway. It's, it's being co-composed. Um, but uh, there's a lot of things up in the air because of COVID-19 and when we might be able, be able right. to get together again. 
Um, and it comes with a big budget. And so we've applied for some substantial grants, also takes a lot of time. Um, but because we applied for these substantial grants, we have the university behind us. And uh, at the point that we learn if we received any of these grants, uh, we have a good feeling that somehow, because the project will be so far along at that point, um, we can get funding. Mm -hmm. um, but it has taken a year. <laughs> right. right. And oftentimes we don't think that far out when we're trying to build a project. We, we might think that far out if a composer tells us, oh yeah, I can't write your, the piece you're interested in until this date. And okay, I'll wait. But, right. And then we wait, you know, and then we go about our lives and we wait and we get this right. new piece finally and we say, oh, great, you know, I, I, I'm getting it in September, I'll premiere it in November or whatever. We know how all of that goes. This is different. You must work collaboratively. That was the other part of yesterday's talk that I talked about too, is this notion of you can't do it alone. Any kind of advocacy work needs allyship, first of all. It's required. Uh, in order for it to thrive as uh, the, the cause to thrive as much as you want. But in this case, the hip hop project also is layers deep with right. the levels of advocacy and, and who is benefiting from it. Um, so it's terribly exciting. I, I mean, I personally can't wait to see what music comes out of this thing. Yeah. So how many, how many composers, how many, uh, artist are you are you working with like what's the scope of it so right now um the the grant the the big grant we submitted is for six new works to be written over a one-year period um and which means um if if it's not six composers and six hip-hop artists maybe it's four composers and maybe four or five hip-hop artists but then someone's writing a mul you know two works um and maybe the works aren't exclusively for wind ensemble anymore, especially post COVID. We may, we may right. really need to be smaller in, in size. And so, uh, so we're open to that, but it's the, the, the scope of the project as of now is six new works, um, to, uh, to be, you know, I don't know how long, I mean, I, I'm not sure, probably at least 60 minutes of music at least. Wow. That, that's what a what a neat project. I mean, um, so I, I guess they ultimately the 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 plan for it is for concerts to be in Athens. But are there longer like term performance plans of of it going on the road in some way or another? Yeah, that's oh, that's such a good question. Um, originally, uh, we felt so good about this being in Athens, about Athens, you know, so personalized to us. Um, but we also know this model and the story behind the model of, of creating these works and the relationship building and, and truly like in our hearts, the, the bridges that we hope to, to build, mm -hmm. we're calling this project, the Athens hip hop harmonic. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, we would love to tour with it. Oh my gosh. Uh, and what could be interesting actually is that again, the venues that we go to would not be the typical venues that a wind ensemble tour would go to, right? right. It wouldn't be universities. Right. It would be, we might need universities help. We might need the help of music faculty to say, oh yeah, check out this, I'll get you into this club or I'll get you into this sure. community center. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I would think touring would be a natural outgrowth, but we weren't, we haven't even begun to think that yet. <laughs> um, well. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, oh, I was going to say one direction the conversation went rather um, spontaneously was what if or what does the piece of music need to look like to get radio airtime mm -hmm. on hip hop right. radio? Right. Not even on, you know, NPR, something sure. but like on hip hop radio. And so then that's fascinating because then it thinks, whoa, like we are composers now may have to consider a different form to the piece of music that would be acceptable for radio play, mm -hmm. um, which also is nothing we ever naturally think about from our, from our standpoint. Right. Right. Well, that's, you know, and the other, the other thing about pieces, like, there seems to be the more unique, you know, the instrumentation or the performers, 
the more, you know, the more potential there is for those pieces to exist for a short time and mm -hmm. then to, um, you know, uh, be shelved, right? You know, um, so the kind of fostering this project, not just to completion initially, but long-term, you know, yeah. seeing how that moves forward, I think is an important part of that too, right? Right, seeing how it moves forward and also recognizing the, um, what it takes to be sustainable, right? which it will take resources of time. It will take resources, uh, financial resources. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also takes like, it takes an, a clear and deliberate intention to say, right. this is so important. I know that if I personally drop out of that project, it will lose some of the steam sure. because I'm, one part of the uh, momentum of it. Right. Um, so I have to reserve time for that. You know, this is part of the sort of learning how to reprioritize when you're diving into advocacy work. You can't, mm -hmm. it, it, it takes consistent effort and it takes planning, just like we get used to planning anything else that we do on a regular basis. Um, but when, if, if, if this line of work is new to you or newish to you, um, it takes constant evaluation, reassessment of, okay, whoops, uh, how is it that three weeks went by and we didn't reach out to our hip hop friends? How did that just happen? Well, we all, you know, we can say so easily, oh, I know why that happened and I got buried in this and that and that. But, you know, some things have to start falling away. Uh, in order to leave time for it. I, I don't want to mess this up. <laughs> you know, right. I personally don't want to fall into, so sorry, I didn't have time and right. I got buried into the stuff I'm saying I, I want to change. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. yeah, for so, sure. Yeah, so so it felt important to, to, you know, just come back to those two very significant examples of advocacy and advocacy work. Um, that also doesn't always, it can feel artistically interesting and that can feel like you're, that's driving it. And I'm, I'm super interested in that piece yeah. of it, but you have to recognize in the way of educating yourself that that actually takes a lot of time too. And a oh. lot of, um, you know, a lot of meetings, a lot of reading, a lot of questions, a lot of, um, establishing a rapport with one another that involves trust and honesty and um yeah yeah that's uh it, it takes time it's a lot of deep deep work that yeah. doesn't necessarily seem creative at, at the moment it seems like there's a lot i mean i mean creative in this terms of like we think of a performance as creative right it doesn't feel directly related to the music right because right. when right. we are used to working with a composer we may say you know here's what i'm looking for and if we don't hear from that composer until we get the piece then that's fine you know um but otherwise <laughs> we have a little <laughs> This is also part of the two. <laughs> sorry. Welcome to sorry. Happy <laughs> sorry, everybody. Welcome to Sunday night in Nate's right. house, huh? <laughs> It's bath time, I think, so. Is it okay? Yeah. Oh, that so, was cute. I'm sorry for the interruption, but I, okay. I guess what, what, I was, what I was saying was the, um, it's, it's not immediately creative in the sense of, you know, we think of a performance or preparing for performance as laying the groundwork for the creativity to happen in terms of the traditional sense. Right, right. And it's, it's, you know, in this case, concert music, uh, Western <laughs> European concert music with, uh, or the, the foundation of which is where we're coming from and with hip hop. I mean, you can't, my gosh, these two are so far from one another, um, except then it's you know the composer's jobs and the hip hop artist's jobs to find where where the intersections happen, how uh, one might treat rhythm and how another might treat melody and how, you know I mean it just can go on how, how improvisation and freestyle rap is a, a 
miss a foundation of hip hop music mm -hmm. and how improvisation is not a foundation of our music and, and how do those two worlds coexist in this? Um, yeah, these are the questions and these are the risks that we're very willing to take. Um, but you're right, before any of that can actually be sort of felt and really dug into, all of these other things had to happen first. Um, so yeah, it's more about building of the relationships and connection to one another and um, understanding, you know, understanding the differences we have, but also understanding our passion for music and um, our love of Athens too. I mean, we mm -hmm. want to contribute to Athens. So, so yeah, I, I, I so appreciate the chance to share yeah. both of those stories. My pleasure. I'm, I'm happy to hear about it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, well I do think I need to I'd go and <laughs> take care of her. But uh, yeah, it's okay. um, thanks so much for, for uh, circling back with them. Okay. Thanks, Nate. Right. Bye. Bye.